Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything. everything. Welcome to Left, Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are joined today by Stu of Stu and the Negro Problem. Thank you. Thanks for joining us here at Left of Black. You've been here at Duke uh, for the last few days yes. uh, performing Notes of a Native Son. Song, yeah. 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 How's it been so far? It's been cool. It's been cool. For, you know, a series of shows is always better than just one. Yeah. Because you get a feel for the place, you get a feel for what people know, what people laugh at, how they, you know, feel about the situation. The show we do is particular in that there's no particularly right way to respond to it. <laughs> so we also have to get a feel for where we're at yeah. and how we're going to perform and what people laugh at and what people take seriously. So we're feeling that. It's a collaboration, basically. It's a tribute to James Baldwin, of course, and, and yeah. imagining James Baldwin as a blues singer, right. as, right. as I read in one of the yeah. quotes. Yeah. Um, how did you come to Baldwin? Um, I came to Baldwin in a very strange way which someone who uh, was doing a, there was a centennial uh, of his, uh, actually I don't know, if, I can't remember if it was his birth or death centennial, um, 2014. And uh, a newspaper was doing an interview with a bunch of different artists who were involved in this particular Baldwin oriented yeah. event. And when I got to the interviewer and told her I first heard Baldwin's name when I was about nine or 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And she said, you, you are the single, you were the only person that I've talked to, the only artist I've spoken to who wasn't introduced to him in college. <laughs> now the thing is, obviously I wasn't reading him at nine years right. old, but I had these African American teachers who were interested in explaining to us, I'm born in 61, yeah. so at that time they were trying to explain to us just how expansive blackness actually was. And one way they did it was they taught us about expatriates. Mm -hmm. So even though we didn't know, I say this in the show, we didn't know the work that they were talking about, but they planted the names in our heads. Richard Wright, James Baldwin, you know, Chester Himes, they just said these names. And they also said Dexter Gordon, yeah, you know, and they yeah. said Nina Simone. So we kind of, you know, you heard these names maybe from your parents, maybe from your sisters, but the point is, they planted the seeds yeah. so that yeah. when I entered the library or the bookstore, I felt ownership because I saw this name and I'm like, oh, that's who Ms. Madera said, you know what I mean? <laughs> so later on, I just felt ownership and I felt like I had these people that I knew already. And that expatriate story, of course, maps on to your own career in some ways. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, not in some ways, really my life. Yeah. I mean, he shaped my life. He really did. I mean, the story starting in, of course, the elementary school teachers, they gave us, you know, a partly mythological view of what happens to the, you know, black expatriate, which Baldwin obviously dealt with, you know, in some of his writing, right, you right. know, the myth versus the reality. But the fact of the matter is, they started me on my way, these elementary school teachers, just by talking to us about the possibility that there was life beyond where we were. And by saying not only was there life beyond where we were, but there were ideas and ways of thinking. Yeah. That were beyond where we were, you know. And they really, sh he he made me go to Europe. He made me leave L.A. to to go to New York, and he 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 set me on my way. He really did. When you think about Raoul Peck's film, um, or right. uh, if Bill Street could talk, yeah. the new film, um, have you been surprised that somehow Baldwin still resonates? Not with at all. So many folks. I'm not at all surprised, and I know you're not either, <laughs> because uh, because. Um, he has this uncanny thing that I think the real, you know, he's got that Shakespeare thing where it's like there's so much in it yeah. that so many people can relate to. I really discovered this when I started teaching, you know. There's just so much in it. Sometimes people that disagree <laughs> vehemently can both agree that right, they find, love find him. Find ground. In right. different, yeah, yeah, they find right. something in him. He's just got that knack. And he, I've had so many students tell me, I feel like he's talking to me. Yeah. I don't know how you learn that or how you get that. I think it does have something to do with being part preacher, part writer, you know what I mean? But that people say, I feel like he's standing right there talking to me. I don't feel like I'm actually reading. There's a great quote uh, that you gave, I want to say it's LA Weekly, and you, you talk about the fact that um, 
your Baldwin might not be someone else's yes, Baldwin. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. But your Baldwin is just as valid. Right, right, As right. everybody else's Baldwin. There's a piece around the way that you deal with Baldwin listening to the songs um, where you're jettisoning this kind of respectability politics mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that seemed to be the context in which the mainstream would want to absolutely, accept someone like Absolutely, Baldwin. absolutely. We came to him as a rock band. I came to him as a yeah. rock and roller, really. And I feel like he lived his life as a rock and roller, you know? And I mean, and rock and rollers are nothing if not connected to the black yeah. church. I mean, that's where we started. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when, 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 uh, when Luke in uh, Amen Corner says, um, God put this music in my soul, so we got to blame the Holy Ghost a little bit for this. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, and that's so true, you know? I mean, that's, that's where we discovered it, right? Yeah. So you, you get to this place, yeah, where, um, where um, this, this, this way that he has, you know, again, of just communicating the expatriate influence, the um, him sort of telling, I felt like he was telling me, you got to be the black that you need to be, mm -hmm. you know, and not this mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. kind, you know. And, and I felt that was very, for me, uh, I based that in music. And, um, and um, we can talk about this maybe later, but, you know, this was commissioned by Harlem Stage. Yeah, right. So... It's a homecoming of, of sorts. Yeah. yeah, and I knew, I felt like, kind of like the crazy nephew who was coming home from Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know, you know, that we all got that nephew, yeah. you know. And um, that I was just going to tell my truth, and then we could just have that family situation, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was that was that was beautiful for us. And I mean, you mentioned <clears> how your <throat> teachers were trying to create a, an expansiveness for you all as, mm -hmm. as students. Um, there's a way in which your career and your music embodies this, right? Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. you've been doing this for more than 20 years. Yeah. You know, if you put on your local urban radio station, you're not going to hear Stu. Right, 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 uh, right, right. And right, in right. some ways, if you don't actually have a relationship with the stage, yeah, you might not know who right, Stu right, is. Right, 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 right. But your blackness is just as valid, right? right as right. as as Drake's val right, uh, blackness right, is right, as Beyonce's right, right, can. Right, right. Talk about the challenge of doing this music, knowing that you're not necessarily going to reach the kinds of audiences that might most benefit from actually seeing you. In the I world. look at I look at that. Uh, what does the brother say? What is the phrase? The long tail or whatever they call it. The long. I really the music and the work that changed me was often the stuff that wasn't necessarily mainstream. Yeah. The right. things that somebody played for me after you leave the club, you hear the club music all night, and then you go hang with somebody afterwards, and then what I call 3 a.m. records, the records they put on at 3 a.m., you know, yeah. the, the late Coltrane, the stuff that you, you know, you know, the, the, the Marvin song you don't know <laughs> off the double album, yeah. you know, right. the, the last song on side three that they really never, radio never got around to that one either, right. you know? <clears throat> Black radio That's never great. got to that one. So we all got our, you know, our 3 a.m. song, our, our, our you know, Stevie's got them, we all got them, right? Yeah. So I just look at it as being like, I really do feel like things come around. Work kind of rises yeah. in some way. And I have proof of this because our audiences get now, you have people who, we're old school now. Like, we're like, we're like this obscure, <laughs> you know, yeah. old school thing that a lot of young people actually find pleasure in seeking out stuff that right. wasn't on their radar. Right. You know, so that's the other beautiful thing about art, that it, 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 gets, it gets there, you know. I'm in no hurry, <laughs> you know. One of the things I like about your music, your compositions, is that, you know, we're close in age. Um, it sounds like the music of my childhood, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. I grew up listening to Top 40 radio mm -hmm. in New York City, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. when I hear your music, I hear yeah. Chicago, sure, and I'm sure, hearing sure. Zeppelin, but I'm also yeah. hearing Harold Melvin in the Blue. Totally, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's the thing, yeah. Me and uh, Heidi Rodewald, my collaborator, uh, she comes from, you know, uh, very white Orange County, and I come from, you know, <laughs> where middle class black, you know, uh, Fairfax District of Los Angeles, but we were both listening to the same soul station yeah. and the same pop stations. And yeah, it's all, it's all in there, you know, it's all in there. It's all in there. And I mean, honestly, my, I think the roots of my politics in some way are, come from radio, come from the first time I heard um, the Beatle record, Abbey Road, mm -hmm. I was in a room full of um, guys that all looked like Huey Newton. And um, <laughs> my dad had dropped me off with a cousin. And the cousin didn't know my dad was going to drop me off. So they were in there, uh, you know, in indulging in certain <laughs> ways that young men would indulge in the late 60s, you know. <clears throat> and I smelled this interesting smell. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I sat down. 
and they they were all like big afros black leather jackets with thin lapels the glasses yeah. Yeah. and they said listen to this and they put these headphones on my head and it was to this day when i listen to abbey road wow. i think black panthers so wow. that's kind of like my you know, what I mean? <laughs> you know when when who was it what was it? the temptation said the beatles new records of gas you know it's right. like right th that was just all kind of mixed up for me you know yeah. when i grew up the living the bedrooms that i remember i'm old enough to remember where there would be malcolm on a wall angela on a wall john lennon on yeah. a wall yeah. 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 and then you know she, and i thought all those people were in the same business right <laughs> no, I really, I grew up, I That's wasn't great. sure if Angela, I thought she was a rock star. Yeah. And I thought John Lennon was a political activist. You know what I mean? I mean, it was just how it felt back then. Yeah. You know? And, you know, I don't like to get too into the whole nostalgia thing, but I, 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 I know that's part of the soil that I came out of. When you think <clears> about <throat> some of your earliest work, um, and I'm thinking specifically of post-menstrual mm -hmm, syndrome, mm -hmm. would you think that 22 years later, we would still be having these ridiculous conversations <laughs> about blackface, right? In, in some ways, we're having more conversations so about funny. blackface now than we would have had when you dropped the album. That's really interesting. I have not thought about that title in, since all this has happened. Yeah, right? Yeah, amazing, right? But I mean, in the same time, I mean, there's like a, there's like a, you know, as you get older, what do you, be, you become aware of the cyclical nature of things. That, that, that to me is like the payoff you know, for being older, is that, yes, are we still here? I, yeah, and I guess we're still here because we've always been there, yeah. you know, in some way. That's the sad part. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know where where exactly. I haven't figured that part out yet, but I remember when Obama was elected, the Village Voice asked all these black artists, they said, so what do you think is going to happen now? And I'm not a prophet. I'm just a, I'm just a regular person, but I said, this is going to bring all the racists out of the woodwork. Yeah. They've always been here, but this, they're gonna, now they're going to start talking you know, and acting, you know, mm -hmm. and that happened. And again, that wasn't, a, that wasn't some wild outlandish prophecy. That was yeah. just a, a black person speaking about what they <laughs> learned and experienced all their lives, you know, that this was going to give them permission. And sure enough, we saw what happened, you know, yeah. and we're experiencing it now full blown, you know. The year that Obama <clears throat> is elected, uh, Passing Strangers is on Broadway. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you get this question a lot about, you know, pre- Passing Strange mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and post Passing yes, Strange. Very much, yeah, yeah, very um, much. At least in terms of the impact of your career and, and the kinds of audiences that you're now able to connect yeah. to because of it. Yeah. Well, I do want to say we felt very much connected to that yeah. election, needless to say. It felt like something was happening. Like there was some sort of change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seemed like he had some things in common with our play, and the perspective of the play had some things in common with him. Uh, a lot of the people that I was trying to reach with that play uh, was mostly like black people who came from situations similar to mine right. or came from or knew of situations like mine. Those people were coming to me after the show. They really didn't even have to come to me after the show. I could hear it in it where they laughed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, That they were like, thank you yeah. for, you know, saying what, this right. ain't nothing new. It's just right. new because it hasn't been on this stage right. before. And so I felt like he was so much of a part of that. And yeah, um, that recognition to know, to be able to hear that you're reaching them, and also to have, you know, uh, quite frankly, Asian Americans and you know, Latino people saying the exact same thing, saying we are not this monolith, and it's we feel yeah. connected to this as well. You know, the fact that you're sort of blowing the whole lid off this thing. You know, how do you feel about this conversation now in 2019? Like, you know, so I'm on Twitter and I'm seeing all this conversation about, um, uh, you know. Folks who are descendants of American slaves, okay. right? That's, that's this new kind of framework okay, okay, in which okay. folks, and, and a lot of it has come out of folks trying to parse what to do with Kamala Harris. Right. Right. You know, so it's right. a whole conversation about who is really black and the really black folks are the folks yeah. who are descendants of American, right, right. <clears throat> American slaves. Um, do you think that if, you know, if we're talking about blackness as a ship right now, <laughs> That, that, that there is room for everybody in the ship at this moment, right? I mean, there's a way in which clearly Passing Strange is trying to make a claim on blackness being as expansive as it can be. Yes. Right? You yes. know, do you think that we're any further in that project now in 2019 ooh, ooh, you that, know, than we were in 2019? <laughs> yes, I do. Because I just think that the conversations are being had. Okay. The conversations are being had, I think, in a very intense 
way. I, like you, I'm privileged to spend a lot of my life interacting with people who are far younger than me. Right. Yeah. right. So all that that brings, you know, all that that brings to me brings us closer. I feel, even if my students aren't saying <laughs> something that I understand, I'm certainly saying a lot of things they don't understand, but we're looking for the common ground, we're yeah. debating, yeah. and I do think I have to have this sort of optimism that we are getting closer. Because they have certainly changed me. I came with a lot of classic 57-year-old, I came to this last semester, last two semesters, with a lot of classic 57-year-old um, grown black man ideas about trigger warnings and about you know kids being too soft right. and all that. And my kids have, you know, my students have set me down <laughs> and the only reason why it worked is because we both wanted to understand each other, yeah. you know? And so I have to feel like we're getting closer. I mean, even just like the thing of like the way, you know, you know, just pop cultural things like the way young brothers dress in Los Angeles and in Brooklyn right now, you will have a brother on a skateboard with some pants that are from like the LA surfer world tapered, you know, like the LA surfer guys from the late sixties with a biggie shirt, you know, and some hip hop, you know, hat on, you know, or he's got Don King hair or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's a mashup. You know what I mean? Yeah. And to, I look at these guys and I'm, I, I'm, I'm envious. Yeah. Sometimes I'll be like, if I had dressed like you, I would have got the, you know, what beat out of right, me, you know, right, and you guys right. can walk around. Yeah. <laughs> I went into a store, I went into a store recently, I went to a store recently and the playlist was like straight up like old school alternative punk, just completely wild, right? And I go up to this young brother, I'm like, who made this playlist? Because I thought it had to be like the, the manager or something. Right, right. And he goes, I did. Okay. He was 23. He was like, I did, you know? And I was just completely profiled him. Like, there's no way you could possibly be able to old, program all this old school punk rock that I grew up with. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I'm just saying, so I, I have to feel optimistic. Yeah. I have to. I got no, I got no, and that's another thing I learned from JB, you know? I mean, you kind of have to be optimistic. I, I mean, I, I, you can be quietly pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you have to be optimistic out loud. What am I going to, what, what, what am I, who am I serving yeah. by saying, Forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> forget, just go home and forget about it. We wouldn't be sitting here. We wouldn't get up in the morning. You know? We were talking about respectability <clears throat> politics earlier. Um, you, you, of course, dropped two albums last year. The other one's mm -hmm. a total bench. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a way in which they are really in conversation with mm -hmm, each other, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you got the son of the preacher man. <laughs> exactly. You know, trying exactly. to navigate the, this space. Exactly. Um, how important are those conversations for you now to talk about? the way that many of us were raised in, this, in almost rigid environments around the black church, yeah. but yet the black church actually takes us to, for lack of a better way to describe it, a freakier world. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know. yeah, 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 um, yeah. And, and were you thinking about both of those projects at the same time? I definitely was, raised? I definitely was. I was thinking about both of them. There's a lot, I mean, to the point where the actor on the cover who's playing James Baldwin on the cover of Native Song is actually the lead in Total Ben, yeah. Otto Blanks and Wood, you know, that, that was a purpose, we did that one on purpose, yeah. Um, no, this is a, I mean, my God, I mean, like, I am more, I thought I, thought I had left the church behind yeah. in many ways, and then I realized that uh, it has been following me, you know, and when I got into, into making this Baldwin show, it was like, and the Total Ben, it was like, oh my God, it's actually, it's not just following me, it, it is me. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always in dialogue with that. I yeah. feel like we're always in dialogue as an artist, maybe also as a philosopher, we're always in dialogue with our original audience, which to me is family and immediate community. You know, whether we're running from them or running to them, we're creating for them. I really feel that way. I am not ultimately creating for this commercial audience that's out there to buy my, I'm still talking to my father. I'm still talking to the minister at my yeah. church. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and yeah. at bottom, yeah. you know, I'm still trying yeah. to work out that stuff. And all that stuff about how you can um, be, you can wear a nice tweed jacket and wear a tie, you know, and that's the way you're going to get by, you know. It's like all that stuff has been so rudely and so unceremoniously, that rug has been pulled out from under yeah. us so yeah. many times. I will never forget the brother who was in Westwood outside of the college town next to UCLA. 
he was carrying two armfuls of books and he was shot by LAPD when I was in high school. So, you know, I remember Eula Love in 1971, yeah, she held right. a butter knife, she was right. shot at, a, right. you know, so I mean, all none of that stuff, I get it. Who's the brother, uh, Randall, somebody who writes about respectability, Paul, I forget the name. In principle, <laughs> I like a nice tweed jacket much, just as much right. as you, right. but it's not bulletproof. Right. Just two right. weeks ago, man, I was in New Jersey, and I, I looked like, I was dressed like the, the, the dad in the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I, look, I looked about as threatening as, I mean, I had my bald spot on, I had my tweed jacket, really, I had the whole nine, and I had left a bag at a train station. I'm looking at this cop's face, and I look as dorky as possible in this right. moment. Yeah. I just come from, the, and I looked at his face, man, and it was, his eyes were so huge. This white man was so terrified. Yeah. And I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that look. You know, when I used to run around in L.A., you know, yeah. and I'm like, so, yeah, respectability, we know that respectability politics ain't going to make that guy, mm -hmm. right. you know, ain't going to make that guy, you know, not afraid of me, you know. Yeah. There's something else that's got to make that, that's something he has to work on, you know. I can't do it for him. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. This is something that Lisa Thompson and I talk about a lot. Um, you know, One of my favorite people. Yeah. There's a kind of cycle. There's cycles that go on in terms of, you know, where's really the sweet spot for black culture right you know it's some decades it'll be the literature uh -huh. it'll be film uh -huh. you know we, we might be in that film moment now at yeah. some point it's yeah. the music yeah. Yeah. um is the black stage at that point now right because and i think about it in the context of what kind of freedom do artists have in these particular genres at any given time right right and the sweet spot is generally that moment where they have that freedom, and it might not be most visible, right? But the freedom is there because it is. Yeah, not yeah, yeah, most yeah, visible. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, how do you feel about the black stage? These I, I don't know because I have to confess, and this is really embarrassing to confess, but you know, I stumbled into theater. I'm not really a theater guy. Uh -huh. You know, I, I I hear what my friends tell me, and my friends, you know, send me uh, scripts. You know, <laughs> I got some really cool. Uh, Playwright, play writer friends who happen to be African American, who send me, they tease me, they go, I know you ain't coming, but uh, I'm gonna send you the script anyway, <laughs> you know, which I'm appreciative of. And so it certainly seems to me, yes, that there's like a a a a, a urge. Don't hate me. <laughs> That's not mine. There does seem to be an urge and an excitement about truth telling right now. Yeah. But the cynic in me, of course, says. Is this just marketing and then in you know two years it's gonna you know just be another trend or is it like something that's actually real is there actually going to be support and then when I ask myself that question when I get cynical like that I just I go back to you know I did I did a week uh, with Moana Karanga um, just to really see firsthand what the brother was wow. saying <laughs> when I was 30 years old I just did a did a seminar he just did a seminar you know and in what he does he does it on a yearly yeah. basis and I went and I spent a week with him and I've never heard a better argument than uh, we got to build our own institutions yeah. you know yeah. I mean you yeah. can you yeah. can it can be in vogue it can be out of vogue right. but at the end of the day and we see this institutionality forming when you have uh, peel uh, 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 and Spike, right. you know, and all these brothers that are saying, okay, let's, you know, and, and sisters, obviously, that are saying, let's do this, let's make this right. work, and that's institutionality. Right. It might not have a building. Right, right, right. But it's, right. it's, it's, it's a right. part of it, and right. I just feel like we need to always be conscious of that institutional thing that the old school black nationalists yeah. were talking about forever. I and if you're Spike, I mean, you're Spike and you're at this stage of your career and you understand, you know, Jordan Peele's not only nipping at your heels. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. he done caught you already. Yeah, yeah. But to have the understanding that if I really want to get a black Klansman done. Right. 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 Why not think about right, bringing right, him right, on board? Right. 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 Yeah. And let's. Yeah, exactly. And let's not forget about, you know, when 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 Spike was on. Um, uh, one of those shows, I forget where they interview you, uh, Actors Studio, and he talked about, you know, when Oprah and, and, and you know, Cosby came in and, like, gave him money to finish Mom Max. Max. Yeah. Right. So it's like, I'm just saying this, we have to be conscious of this, that it's not going to always be handed right. to us, you know. Right. And I just feel like that's something that I always want to, like, remind, you know, all of my students of, about, about, you know, and especially my students of color, that these networks 
are important, you know, and you can't just wait around. That's another thing. My band, we never waited around in Hollywood for the record deal to happen. We just made our own record. We just released our own records. Right. We toured, you know, right. our low budget tour in a van or whatever, <laughs> but we just did all that because we were not waiting. And I feel like I knew we couldn't wait. Yeah. <laughs> I knew we couldn't wait. I knew you had to just go out and do it, yeah. you know. We've been joined today by Stu of Stu and the Negro Problem. Um, thank you, man, for coming through. Thank you, man. This it's a pleasure to be here. You know? I mean, you, it's man. not every day I get to sit where Fred Moten sat, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that I, you know, you know, got somewhere close to Fred's level. How you doing, Fred? <laughs> and a quick shout out to Aaron Greenwall um, for his cur curatorial efforts. Yes, and of course, yes, yes, Stu yes, here yes, yes, yes. Great to, to be here, man. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot Hard black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black, 